Hey guys, Paldio here. I've been reading a lot of misinformation about the advantages of Super NT over RetroArch when it comes to achieving zero latency for speedrunning and tight platforming, so I thought I'd make a quick video to teach you guys how to achieve zero latency for Kaizo on even the most underpowered of systems. Now, while these settings might be useful for other games and systems, I'm gonna be focusing exclusively on Super Mario World Kaizo ROM hacks, where a quick response time is almost a necessity. Now, getting everything you need to play on console can be expensive. You have to invest on a console and an SNES compatible controller, a flash card, maybe even a capture card if you wanna record or stream your gameplay. So with RetroArch, you only need a device that can run it. It can be a personal computer, a modded console, or even a retro handheld. For example, here I have Quickie 2 running on a $100 emulation handheld. And trust me, if this device is capable of running Kaizo games with no latency, I'm sure your system will perform much better. In case you're wondering, this is an RG351MP by Amber Nick. So I've recently switched to RetroArch from Super NT because of the advantages it has over playing on console. Here are some of the pros and cons of console and RetroArch. So the console pros are no configuration needed, it's just plug and play. No additional CPU usage on streaming or recording PC, so you don't have to worry about your emulator taking up resources when you want to stream or record your gameplay. And the last benefit I think is synced audio. I'll get that in just a moment, but you will always get a little bit of audio latency when you're using RetroArch on PC, unfortunately. Now, some of the console cons are inaccurate clock time on Super NT. So many of you guys might not know this, but the Super NT does not run at an accurate clock speed. It runs at 60 frames per second, and the SNES runs at 60.09 frames per second. A negligible difference. I think it's maybe one second every 10 minutes. But you know, if you're a purist, or if you're really into speedrunning, it might be important to have an accurate clock speed. Another console con is the limited choice of input devices. Unless you have like an 8-bit retro receiver, you're most likely gonna have to only use SNES controllers. So if you wanna use a PS5 controller, or you wanna use maybe your keyboard or something else, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult. And the final console con is having to transfer all your ROM hacks from your PC to your SD and every time you want to update your games as well. Now, the RetroArch Pros, and these are many. You have the accurate clock speed at 60.09 frames per second. You can use almost any input device. Multiple save states and slowdown for practice. Choice of filters, like for example, you can set RetroArch to look like a CRT or like an LCD and many other cool filters, like for example, VHS or even Technicolor. 4K support. Obviously, retro games in 4K might seem a little bit silly, but I think it's awesome that RetroArch has 4K support, especially when you want to use things like square pixels and integer scaling. All your files are already on the PC, so there's no need to transfer them to your SD card, to your flash card, or your modded console. And finally, you don't need a capture card to stream or record, which I think is one of the biggest benefits. Now, for some RetroArch cons, because there are some the interface is not very intuitive, but hopefully I'll be able to do a good job navigating it and showing you guys what needs to be done. And the audio latency. Unfortunately, until RetroArch supports ASIO drivers, there will always be a small amount of latency with the audio. I'll show you how to improve it in just a minute. And it definitely provides less latency than having to listen to the game from the capture card. Okay, so now that we got all of that out of the way, let's start by installing RetroArch. I recommend going to RetroArch.com and getting the latest stable version for your device. I'm going to be showing my examples on the PC version, but everything I do applies to all systems RetroArch can run on. Once RetroArch is up and running, you need to get an SNES core. RetroArch is not an emulator, it's a front-end for different emulators or cores. So here on the main menu, we're gonna select Online Updater, and then Core Downloader. Here you'll see a list of all the cores or systems RetroArch supports, now, the reason why I suggest getting RetroArch directly from their site instead of places like Steam or the Google Play Store is because it's going to give you the most complete and up-to-date list of cores. So the core we're looking for is SNES 9X 2010. Not the regular SNES 9X or Business or anything else. Now, this is very, very important because the 2010 version still runs every single SMW run hack accurately without using too many resources. The regular SNES 9X core works as well, but it is much more demanding on your system, especially once we start optimizing it for zero latency. 
SNES 9X2005 doesn't run at an accurate clock speed, and some ROM hacks won't even run on it, like Rampo World 2, so I recommend steering clear from that one. Great, now that we have our core downloaded, I'm gonna go through the video and audio options and let you know what settings are important to change. Before we begin, there is one last thing I want to mention. In order to get the best results, you need to use a wired controller and a low latency monitor, preferably one with FreeSync. You are probably already using one if you game on your PC or if you have a Super NT, but I thought I'd mention it since you can only get a response time as fast as your monitor and controller allows. Alright, so let's go to the settings and check out our video options. First thing you want to enable is full screen mode. Giving RetroArch full control over your display will ensure the best results, especially when it comes to syncing the game to our display. If you really need to have RetroArch open in window mode, just know that it won't give you the best results, but you can still get pretty close. Next, we're going to choose our scaling options. None of these affect latency, but it's important to know how to set up the game the way you want it to look. Me personally, I like having square pixels and integer scaling, meaning every pixel will be equal in size, instead of resizing the content full screen on my monitor. Here, you can select a 4x3 aspect ratio if you want as well. Now let's check out the synchronization options. Almost every setting here is helpful, but we're just going to focus on two right now. The first is vertical sync. This will synchronize the content frame rate to your monitor. Next, down at the bottom, we're going to enable Sync to Exact Content Frame Rate. If your monitor supports free sync, games will run at the accurate 60.09 frames per second without screen tearing. If your monitor does not support free sync, the game will still run at the accurate speed, but you'll notice some screen tearing. If you don't want the screen tearing and don't mind playing the game at 60 FPS, then you can leave this option off but I'd absolutely recommend leaving it on, as it will reduce latency. There is one final thing to check here in the video options. If you are using a very underpowered system, I recommend turning on threaded video. I'd be lying if I said I knew what this does. I don't. However, this option allows me to play on my retro handheld and introduces little to no latency. Just like RetroArch says in this case, do not enable it unless you can't obtain full speed otherwise. Great, all our video options are set. So let's do something really quick about the audio. Let's head back to Settings tab and select Audio and then Output. Unfortunately, RetroArch does not offer ASIO support, so you will always have a small amount of audio latency on Windows. Macs have the advantage of being much better at handling audio, and Core Audio will most likely give you less latency. Regardless of your device, I recommend setting it to 32 milliseconds, and if for some reason audio seems to crackle or break, set it back to 64 or a halfway point, maybe like 48. Great, we're almost done. Now we just have to head back into the settings tab and check the latency options, where, as you can imagine, most of the action is going to be taking place. Here you'll see some brand new settings that you haven't seen before. You'll definitely want to enable hard GPU sync and then set hard GPU sync frames to 3. Next is frame delay. I recommend setting this to 10. Increasing it is going to give you an inaccurate frame rate. However, if your system can't handle this option, just set it back one by one until it runs full speed. In polling behavior, you want to select early I wish I knew why this worked the best. It just does. Finally, the most important setting. This is the one that's going to reduce latency the most. Run Ahead. Run Ahead creates more instances of the emulator and runs them a couple of frames in advance so it can respond better to your inputs. Different games have different amount of internal lag frames, and if you exceed them, this will make the gameplay look jittery without any advantages latency-wise. For Super Mario World and its ROM hacks, the magic number you're looking for is 3. 3 will give you the best results while keeping gameplay smooth. You also want to enable the second instance of Run Ahead so you don't get audio problems. And that's it! If you've set up everything correctly, you should be getting identical or better input response than a Super NT while having your games run at an accurate clock speed. If for some reason your system is having trouble running with these settings, I recommend enabling threaded video. If that doesn't fix it, dial back the hard GPU sync frames one by one until it does. That'll be all for now. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below and I hope this helps. I'll see you later.